BBOR, Black Box, Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia at heart and from around the globe. In this episode, I will be discussing a new set of Zodiac Killer books, responding to your comments about the Zodiac Killer interview series that is available here on this channel, and getting an inside look at how homicide detectives conduct their investigations. Firstly, I would like to give a big shout out to longtime BBOR follower Batman66, who has a book recommendation for us, and it is called Johnny Halloween, Tales of the Dark Season. Firstly, this episode is coming out on the eve of Halloween, All Hallows' Eve Eve. And tomorrow, I will be celebrating Halloween with you guys here on Black Box Online Radio. But first, I would like to have an introduction to this book here. And it is indeed Zodiac-related, because it's going to cover several different stories. However, this is an excerpt from Amazon.com. There is more to this holiday celebration besides fiction. The Man Who Killed Halloween is an extensive essay included in the book about growing up during the late 60s in the town where the Zodiac Killer began his murderous spree. In an introduction that explores monsters both fictional and real, Partridge recalls what it was like to live in a community menaced by a serial killer and examines how Zodiac's reign of terror shaped him as a writer. Halloween Night Awaits. Join a master storyteller as he explores the layers of darkness that separate all too human evil from the supernatural. Let Norman Partridge lead you on seven journeys through the most dangerous night of the year, where no one is safe and everyone is suspect. One more time, the book is called Johnny Halloween, Tales of the Dark Season by Norman Partridge. And if anybody would like to turn in to the live stream, it's going to begin at 8 a.m. tomorrow Pacific time, but you can listen at any time throughout the day. And if you want to follow along with all of these discussions, you can hit the like button and subscribe. It really helps out the channel. The next book announcement relates to a new project that is in the works by Mike Rodelli, Mike Rodelli, author of In the Shadow of Mount Diablo and the Hunt for Zodiac. Mike Rodelli is working on a new book about the serial killer, The Monster of Florence. And The Monster of Florence terrorized that Italian city. He was rather similar to the Zodiac Killer. He targeted couples that were parked in lovers' lanes and cars. And in many ways, The Monster of Florence was very vicious. Now, there is a Zodiac Killer suspect that gets accused of both sets of homicides, and his name is Joe Bevilacqua, and I discussed him in the episode, the Zodiac Killer News Report, from September 11th of 2023, if you'd like to hear my take on the subject. But I'm very curious to hear hear everything that Mike Rodelli has to say about the monster of Florence. I can only expect that he's going to get into the Zodiac Killer connections and perhaps debunking them. When I did the episode discussing the monster of Florence here on this channel, I even used one of Mike Rodelli's articles that he has published on his website, microdelli.com, as a big piece of source information because he's very critical of that type of theory. But I just want to know all of his observations about that particular serial killer, even if they are not Zodiac related. Does he have some particular insights? Because Mike Rodelli has followed true crime cases for decades, and I'm going to be eagerly awaiting that one. Next, we have something from Bob Yeatman that was sent in to the Black Box Online Radio email address. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. It's posted in the description box. And he says, Hi, Ned. Hope you are well. Really enjoying the new BBOR style and output on Zodiac. Big move and respect for keeping the quality going. I've been working on a book about the Lake Herman Road murders. The longer I look at the case, the more I think it holds the key. In the course of that, I have coined the phrase, do wo diac and I think it needs to enter the common parlance. Thought you'd be the best person to get it out there and share the opportunity arise. Ain't got no conspiracies, but can't get away from two assailants that night without a car in the turnout. Keep up the good work, Bob. And Bob Eatman, we will be looking out for your book on the Lake Herman Road murders. The Lake Herman Road murders are highly regarded as the first confirmed incident in Zodiac activity, but this is actually a rather interesting theory about how the assailant, or assailants plural, did not even have a car, because the multiple killers theory has been discussed very frequently in the Lake Herman Road murders. Richard Grinnell has a video out about it on his YouTube channel, Richard Grinnell of ZodiacCiphers.com, that is. Thomas Henry Horan has been discussing this for ages about how there were multiple killers, and not only that, multiple assailants at Lake Herman Road, and he even goes into a very big presentation on this in his documentary, The Myth of the Zodiac Killer. But both of these guys have talked about how the killers approach by vehicle, and it appears that Bob Eatman has a theory that there were multiple killers who were not even driving a car, so I'm really, really going to be 
wondering how he's going to tie this all together, and I will look out for your book in the future as well. And as most of you know, there is now an interview series that is available on this channel where I'm going to have different types of guests on the program, starting out with the zodiologists, if you will, zodiac researchers. But in the future, I'm going to be having all types of true crime writers, podcasters, and theorists coming on Black Box Online Radio to talk about their true crime observations. And if you would like to support any of these efforts, you can go over to buymeacoffee.com, buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnet88. And this allows you to make a donation or a contribution to help support the show. And anybody who makes a donation will get a shout out on Zodiac Monday. And I would like to do that right now real fast. Firstly, giving a shout out to River Prawn Pottery. Thank you so much for your regular and consistent support. Floyd Black 53, another long time and very, very generous supporter. And of course, Batman 66. You guys are amazing. And I'm, I'm, I should add that all of these people are very regular supporters of Black Box Online Radio, and anybody can do it at buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnid88, and you can also use the super thanks here on YouTube. But I did an interview recently with Adam Ivester, who runs the YouTube channel Real Zodiac Killer Revealed 2023. His Zodiac suspect is John Parr Cox, and I received two comments that I would like to respond to immediately, as I can put them together. The first is, I wonder what was going through Ned's head when he was interviewing Adam Ivester. And the second one was, I wish that this guy had just written out a bullet point list and sent it to Ned so he could talk about it on Zodiac Monday. Now I'm going to do both of these things all at once. Let's look at the bullet points of what John Parcox has for and against him being the Zodiac Killer, and then I'll share everything about what my responses to Adam's interview were. The first is that there are a lot of pieces of evidence in favor of John Parcox being the Zodiac Killer, being the serial killer that committed all those crimes back in the 1960s. And I'm going to share something very personal with you guys. I first learned about Adam's channel, Real Zodiac Killer Revealed 2023, because he posted in the comments section saying that he had a new suspect and he solved the case. And I was like, yeah, 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 I... I get that at least once a week. Sometimes two or three times a week I get contacted by people saying that they've solved the Zodiac Killer mystery. I'm definitely not impressed by just someone saying that. And then an individual named Barry Lauber, one of you guys in the comment section, he contacted me and said, Hey, would you be interested in reviewing this channel, Real Zodiac Killer Review 2023? And I remember the name because it's rather unique. So I decided to have a look at all of the information that he had compiled on John Parr Cox as a Zodiac Killer suspect. And I had a very brief moment, a very brief moment, when I was thinking, you know, maybe, just maybe this guy Adam has found the Zodiac Killer. Maybe this is actually the guy, because he's using all types of outside-of-the-box thinking, all types of outside-of-the-box research methods. And you want the point list, the bullet points? Number one. The Zodiac Killer committed his first crime on December 20th of 1968, the same day that John Parr Cox lost his private hunting island, and he was indeed a rich man, an elite man. He was member of elite circles. I refer to him as a transportation executive, but Adam said he should be referred to as the owner of a port. I'm still going to call him a transportation executive because he had connections to the railroad. He was someone who had lunches with the mayor, the chief of police. His wife was a socialite. She was referred to as Mrs. John Parr Cox frequently in the papers. He was an attendee of Bohemian Grove, one of the most elite gatherings amongst, well, certain people. Let's just say that. I don't even want to run my mouth too much about that. I've talked a lot about Bohemian Grove here on this channel. And then he was actually a hunting buddy of Bing Crosby, and they had a private hunting island called Brooks Island, which at first I thought was something that they had purchased. But somebody in the comment section did some digging, and they said that it was actually rented. But no matter what, they lost it. So the same day, you can imagine some guy lost his private hunting island, and the Zodiac Killer talked about a story, or he made an indirect reference to the most dangerous game, a story about hunting people for sport. And in the late p.m. hours of that night, someone's thinking, I've lost my private hunting island, I'm a little bit pissed off about that, some guy in an elite circle that doesn't like to lose anything, and then he's reminded of the most dangerous game, for some reason, most dangerous animal of all, 
He sees two teenagers in a parked car, David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen, pulls over on the side of the road and just shoots them. He has committed a murder. Then, John Park Cox is mostly silent for about seven months until you get to the Blue Rock Springs shooting, and that occurred on July 4th of 1969. This is a guy, again, who is interacting with all types of elites, but he's an executive. He's just in the shadows. I mean, if you walk up to the average American and say, hey, do you know who John Park Cox is? They're going to say no. Do you know who Bing Crosby, the entertainer, was? They'd be like, yeah. And this is true, by the way. I love Bing Crosby's Christmas special, the one he did with Frank Sinatra. It's really just them singing Christmas carols. I've been watching it every year since I discovered it. And... Yes, they know who Bing Crosby is. Are they going to know who some of these other attendees of Bohemian Grove are? Sure, just pick um pick a famous president or something. Richard Nixon attended that, but he actually hated Bohemian Grove. I'll discuss more about that in a future episode. Richard Nixon also hated playing golf, but he did it because other elites did. He thought it was a waste of time. I digress from that. So somebody who is interacting in all of these high-profile circles, but he's just in the background. He's just an ordinary guy perhaps compared to some people who are famous, somebody who is seeking fame and glory. And then he decides that he doesn't just want to be in the shadows. He wants to do something that is going to make people recognize him indirectly, hence the creation of the Zodiac Killer persona. And that's why he starts making phone calls, taking credit for the crimes. That's why he starts writing letters, taking credit for the crimes. That's why he designs the hooded costume that was worn at Lake Berryessa, witnessed by Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard. So then John Parr Cox starts, again, writing these letters and cryptograms. And perhaps Adam's strongest piece of evidence is that John Parr Cox has extraordinarily similar handwriting to the Zodiac Killer. Perhaps some of the closest handwriting matches that I have ever seen to the Zodiac. And you'll see that here on the screen as it's going by. And here's another point that Adam really likes to reinforce. It was discussed by Soren Korsgaard in his book, America's Jack the Ripper, about how Soren believes that the Zodiac Killer may have had mild dyslexia, and John Parr Cox had mild dyslexia, and that is the reason why the Zodiac is misspelling so many words. And if you look on the handwriting sample that's been provided, John Parr Cox says that he's interested in Japanese history, and he even misspells the word Japanese, and it ends in an S. It's misspelled because he had mild dyslexia. He, this is something that he regularly did. Not to mention that Adam has a theory that, and it's a reasonable theory, that he can place the Zodiac in two points of activity, in two locations of Zodiac activity. On the night of the Zodiac's final crime, the murder of Paul Stein on October 11th of 1969, that there was a performance of Kushikara, a kabuki theater play, near Mason and Geary, where the Zodiac allegedly got into Paul Stein's taxi, near the theater district, John Park Cox, as an elite, was president of the Japan, the Japan Society, and he was actually even a member of the Tokyo Yacht Club. He included that in the form that's being used for the handwriting sample, and then he also lived 80 yards away from the site of the Stein murder, so he would leave the performance of Kushigara, commit the Stein murder, and walk home, and he walks into his house, and then perhaps he got a little bit lucky that the police are thinking that they're firstly need to be on the lookout for a black man and secondarily that they're searching in the wrong place all right so you guys know that story that's the famous thing involving falcon zones but that is a set of points in favor of john park cox the set of points against i had the ultimate realization that john park cox is outside of a lot of the parameters what was going through ned's head during the interview well, I had the opportunity to interview Adam three times. Adam is actually in one of the lost Zodiac Killer Channel's Interview with the Experts videos, the three that have been recorded that have never been released. The third one was with Adam Ivester, and in that one you can hear all of my genuine reactions to things as he is sharing them. And Adam and I also did one offline that wasn't able to have been uploaded, and again you can hear my genuine reactions to things. I know I seemed a little bit stone-faced in the interview, and that's why, because I knew I knew what he was going to say to some of the questions, because we've done it before. But ultimately, originally I thought, maybe, just maybe, this guy has found the Zodiac. But John Parcox was six feet four inches tall. He was 245 pounds. He was 50 years old at the time of Zodiac activity. His birthday was in November, so during all of the confirmed murders, he was 50 years old. I think that he was too tall, too big, too heavy, 
and too old. I mean, he's outside of all of the parameters. The Zodiac is mostly, well, like I said in the past, that I only highly entertain suspects that are 5 feet 8 inches tall to 6 feet tall, because those are the more or less hot zone of specific statements from the witnesses. Mike Michaud said he saw a 5 foot 8 suspect. The Robbins kids, who provided the details for the composite sketch, said they saw a 5 foot 8 suspect. Cecilia Shepard estimated that the Zodiac was 6 feet tall, and the, um, the sighting from Officer Falk said 5 foot 10. Now, I just can't imagine that someone would look at a 5 foot 10 individual who is actually 6 foot 4, like the guy's 6 foot 4. And here's another point. John Park Ox was actually 6 foot 5, but he lost an inch of his height because of back surgery. And one thing in the um, Lost interview that I talked about was, all right, I'm going to try and be generous. I mean, our former president, Ulysses S. Grant, lost three inches of his height because of slouching. So they say, I mean, I didn't know President Grant. I wasn't around during that time, but so the history books say. And even if you're going to do something like that, six foot four, he's still down to six foot one. You're going to think that that guy is five foot eight or five foot ten. And also at Lake Berryessa, he would have been wearing very, very thick soled shoes, as well as the Lake Berryessa hood. If he were indeed six foot four, he might have appeared to have been six foot six or something like that. And that was what one of you guys in the comment section wrote. So thank you for that observation. And I have to give a shout out to Melissa Rose Tapa, who responded to the interview with Adam. And she said that there's a particular story that was told about how the Zodiac may have been inspired by an incident that John Park Cox had when he was a kid. I mean, hypothetically, if John Park Cox were the Zodiac, and it involves a story where John Park Cox was in the car with his grandmother and they were driving down the road and they saw a cow that was bloated that had too much gas in it and she told him to take a pair of scissors and just stab the cow to let the gas out and the gas shot out for four feet. There was a four foot blast of, well, cow gas for lack of a better term, maybe some methane particles or something like that and it turned out that grandmother was telling the truth and she knew what she was doing and then she went and wrote a nasty note on the farmer's door and i can only gather it said something to the effect of you need to take care of your herd this cow would have died if we hadn't let the gas out but what melissa says is that as far as that being an inspiration for the zodiac killers lake Berryessa stabbing stabbing something and then writing a nasty note that was done in a humanitarian reason. That's done to help the cow, not to hurt it. And at Lake Berryessa, Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard, the victims, were both stabbed in the back, and the Zodiac did write a note on Brian Hartnell's car door. But I think I side with Melissa on that one, that that was not done in any malicious way. It's more, I mean, yes, it's a little bit angry to say, take better care of your cows, but they weren't even trying to hurt the cow. They were trying to help the cow. So... That is a that is a that is a side note because I have no idea no idea what truly inspired the Zodiac Killers Lake Berryessa stabbing. The stuff I want to focus on would be John Park Cox is very tall, very large, very heavy, and very old. High, uh, age descriptions. Brian Hartnell estimated that the voice he heard at Lake Berryessa was between age twenty and thirty, and um, Officer Falk even said that it could be mid third. 30s to mid 40s. Now, that's one thing that Adam tries to zone in on. And to his credit, he's saying, okay, a 45 year old guy could look like a 50 year old guy. But at the same time, Nancy Slover, I believe, said that the voice she heard talking to the Zodiac was estimated to have been around 30 years old. I don't know. I mean, all of this stuff seems like John Park Cox is outside the realm of physical parameters when we actually talk about biometrics. I think that he is just a little bit too far. So that is my honest take on the subject. But, you know, I did a live stream last Thursday, and every Thursday I do live streams here on this channel now. And Richard Grinnell of ZodiacCiphers.com joined the live stream, and he asked me, if you could interview anyone whom you've never interviewed before, who would you choose? And I had to think for a while, because no one's asked me that question. I didn't know what Richard was going to say. And it should have been a no-brainer. I should have said Robert Graysmith and Gareth Penn. And I decided to ask you guys, who would you like to hear interviewed on Black Box Online Radio? And a lot of people said Robert Graysmith. Now, I'm going to be very honest with you. I don't think that he's going to do it. I wrote to him once. He didn't write back. Gareth Penn, as well as I understand, is retired from the subject. He does not want to um, perhaps come on the channel, but I would love to interview both of them. Gareth Penn is the author of Time 17, who has talked about Michael O'Hare as the Zodiac Killer. He is also the author of the book The Second Power. I have book discussions on both of these. 
I also have a book discussion on Robert Graysmith's Zodiac Unmaster on this channel. As I said, feel free to go through some of the older episodes of BDOR, all the way back to the old black box recordings. Now, some people were taking exception, or they, they didn't think too highly of my interview with Adam Ivester from Real Zodiac Killer Revealed 2023, but here are the rules that I have, or the guidelines that I'm using for having guests on the show. You can have any suspect, you can have any theory, as long as I believe the person is genuine. If somebody has been proven to be a fraud, no reason to bring them on. No Gary Stewart, sorry, Gary Stewart, author of The Most Dangerous Animal of All, and that includes Susan Mustafa and Michael Wachschel, the author of The End of the Zodiac Killer Mystery. Those people are all more or less proven frauds. I don't need to bring them on. Now, somebody uh, requested, oh, I think it was actually uh, Bruce who requested bringing on Tom Colbert of the Case Breakers. Yes, I would interview Tom Colbert of the Case Breakers. I don't think he's going to do it. But he is one of the people who helped bring Gary Francis Post forward as a Zodiac killer. And that would be mostly about challenging him, trying to find out is he fraudulent or not, because there still could be something to explore there. Actually try and get to the truth, because that's what a lot of people do with these interviews. That's what a lot of people do with the interviews that you see on the evening news and such. They're trying to challenge people to see if they're going to reveal something about their agenda. And as far as discussing the case breakers and their suspect, Gary Francis Post, I could talk to Tom Colbert, but that would be mostly about just exploring his credibility. To discuss the facts of the case and the Zodiac mystery, I would rather interview Dale Julin of the Case Breakers, who was supposed to release some book called Catching Zodiac, but he um, either delayed the publication of his book, or I don't necessarily know what's going on with that, but I would love to interview Dale Julin because he's so much more articulate about the facts of the case, whereas when Tom Colbert went on Megyn Kelly's Zodiac Killer show, I did a direct response to it, he didn't even understand the basics of it, didn't even know when the first Zodiac crime took place, and as far as Dale Julin goes, he's much more articulate, he's the guy who actually spent seven years looking into Gary Francis Post as the Zodiac, but the stuff that I would press Dale Julin on would be his claim that you can take the Zodiac Killer greeting cards, the Peek Through the Pines card, the 13-hole punch card, and even the Zodiac Halloween card, very appropriate for this episode, and you can extract large paragraphs of text from the artwork on the cards, like they're all just telling these very, very long and intricate messages. Like on the Halloween card, for example, it says, I, I, Captain Gary Francis Post on the Hootin' Tootin' MS Dixie, talking about a boat that was on Lake Tahoe at the time. So, very, very, uh, very, very different observations. But Dale Julin also has centered a lot of his Zodiac Killer theory on the disappearance of Donna Lass from 1970. I always want to talk more about the disappearance of Donna Lass. So, I think that that would be much more beneficial for the facts of the case. But if if you um, didn't respond to the polling question, is there somebody that you would like to hear on the channel? A lot of people requested Tom Voigt of ZodiacKiller.com, and I did reach out to him, and I would definitely have Tom Voigt on the show to um, discuss the Zodiac case with them. And a lot of people even just said they wanted to hear Tom Voigt because he didn't do the previous Zodiac Killer interview series on the Zodiac Killer channel, as well as he's also been someone who has attracted a lot of people to the mystery, and even I am someone who ultimately started making videos partially because of Tom Voigt. I mean, there were some other people involved, but I wanted to respond to the profiles that were on ZodiacKiller.com, and I wanted to just say what I thought about the case. And as, as previously stated, there are some other influences. My first Zodiac episodes were also on Lyndon Lafferty's theory, because I heard him on the radio show The Savage Nation, and at the time I was very curious about Louis Myers, the suspect that was brought forward by Randy Kenny. So it's a combination of influences. But again, if there's somebody that you would like to hear on, on this channel interviewed, and it can go beyond just the Zodiac killer world, because uh, somebody recommended having Carl De Niro on the program. He is one of the surviving victims of the Son of Sam shooter and went on to write a book called Why I Wasn't Shot by David Berkowitz. And my answer is, number one, I would love to talk to Carl. I would love to talk to some more people from the Son of Sam world, except there are certain things that I really wanted to do with that case that I haven't done yet. I talked about this a little bit before. Back in the spring, I did an episode on the psychological profile of David Berkowitz, and I had a whole set of Son of Sam things that I wanted to do. I wanted to launch this massive deep dive 
but for some reasons I wasn't able to do so, and I would like to go through those things first. This year, though, I was able to get out one episode called Son of Sam, The Death of John Carr, which started a lot of discussions in the comments section, and that was just one thing that I had pl been planning on doing. And that episode didn't even come out exactly the way that I wanted, it, due to some technical reasons. I covered the source material, I think, the way that I wanted to, but again, just some some issues with that one. But there are things with the Son of Sam case that I want to evaluate. But I don't know how you guys are going to respond to this. However, it is my understanding and my observation from interacting with people who closely follow the Son of Sam world that a lot of them have been heavily influenced by a book called The Ultimate Evil by Maury Terry. And these Son of Sam sleuths, this Son of Sam community, is way more vicious than the Zodiac community, way more vicious than the Zodiac sleuths, just the type of arguments that you see in the comments section, whereas people in the Zodiac disagree about suspects, whereas people in the Son of Sam world are talking about how there's this evil underground cult that is trying to kill us all, and you only get that a little bit in the Zodiac world. There are people that do say that, and they've said that stuff to me to me in the past about how they were stalked by so-and-so, and that um, this person is connected to all types of governmental operations and so on. But I don't even want to get into that right now, because I think a lot of that is a big distraction. And moving on to the next segment here on this channel, as some of you guys know, from time to time, I get on Amazon.com and I start, well, looking at new books to read in all types of genres, not only true crime, and one that was recommended to me by the Amazon algorithm, if we want to call it that, is Zodiac Killer, the terrifying true crime story of the mysterious serial killer by Declan Rockwell. And this was a book that I hadn't heard before, so I pulled up a free sample of this from Kindle, and his free sample from his book, Zodiac Killer, are talking about, is talking about the Lake Herman Road murders, again, December 20th of 1968, which saw the deaths of David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. And it mostly is um, some very basic retellings of the facts. But I thought this one was particularly odd because I have to confess something to you guys again. I don't know if I have ADD or what, but when I pull up a book, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, I don't always read it straight through. I tend to jump around a little bit, even with something such as a free sample from Kindle. I tend to jump through, jump around, and I saw that there was an individual that he was discussing named Lundbag, and I didn't really think too much about that. I didn't recognize the name, but I did see the name Butterback. I thought that it was misspelled B-U-T-T-E-R-B-A-C-K, and I was like, oh, I thought Butterback spelled his name a different way. But then I saw that in context that this guy, um, Declan Rockwell, was referring to Lundbag as Sergeant Les Lundblad. That's whom he was actually talking about, but he calls him Les Lundbag. And very, very weird. I'm not necessarily sure why he wouldn't use the correct spelling of anyone's names. But here's the book overview that is available on Amazon.com. A harrowing look at the shocking true story behind the infamous Zodiac Killer. Stalking the streets of San Francisco and other parts of California in the 1960s and 70s, the case of the elusive Zodiac Killer has puzzled America's best law enforcement detectives for decades. With no confirmed identity and only a few sparse eyewitness accounts, America's most well-known serial killer is also its most confusing. Who really was the Zodiac Killer and why did he vanish as suddenly as he appeared? Peeling back the curtain on the rumors, the facts behind this mysterious case, Zodiac Killer, the terrifying true crime story of the mysterious serial killer, offers the readers an all-new glimpse into the deranged mind of the serial killer who was at one point America's most wanted man. Covering his survivors' terrifying accounts and all of their gruesome and harrowing detail, the enigmatic letters and ciphers he left to taunt detectives and to reunite them and to reunite a list of possible suspects, this biography will give you a fresh and up-to-date perspective on what we know about the Zodiac. Okay, so um, when you read a description like that, it does sound pretty good, but I wasn't overly impressed by the Kindle preview, but they definitely get your attention with something like that. And now someone also wanted to draw my attention to a new book that is out called Finding the Zodiac Killer by David Daniel. And David Daniel was someone who would pop up in the comment section here on Black Box Online Radio saying, The Zodiac Killer will be announced in two weeks' time. The Zodiac Killer will be announced in ten days' time. And at first I thought this guy was telling the truth, and then over time I began to think that 
he was just trolling because he would say, the Zodiac will be announced in one week's time. Then the Zodiac will be announced in eight days' time. The Zodiac will be announced in three weeks' time. I might have even blocked him from the channel. I don't exactly remember. But I noticed that he was also doing this in other parts of the internet, even in the group The Zodiac Killer and Me, which is run by Melissa Rose Tapa and Thornton Daniel Jeffrey, which talks about their Zodiac Killer suspect, L.D. Hill. Melissa Rose Tapa has been a guest on this program. She was the guest from the first Zodiac interview that I've done for BBOR. But it, there is a real book that is actually out from David Daniel. It appears that he was not trolling, and his book is called Finding the Zodiac Killer, How I Deciphered the Identity of the Nation's Most Notorious Serial Killer. And it is only available in paperback format for twenty seven ninety nine, And a little bit on the steep side, huh? I'll read this one for you as well. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, a serial killer who called himself Zodiac terrorized Northern California with cold-blooded murders and a series of taunting ciphers and letters. His first set of three ciphers, considered at the time to be one, were sent to newspapers in 1969. They were cracked by a couple within a week. On July 11th of 2021, David Daniel read where the Zodiac had stated in a letter that three ciphers revealed his identity, but the couple and the authorities claimed that it wasn't there. David believed that the authorities had said the cipher didn't reveal the Zodiac's identity for one reason. They couldn't find it. He knew it was there, and he knew that he would find it. He looked at the first one of the three ciphers, the one that had Zodiac and sent to the Vallejo Times-Herald. Excuse me, the one that the Zodiac had sent to the Vallejo Times-Herald. Within three to seven seconds, he knew that he had solved the nation's most notorious unsolved murder case. David studied the cipher further and looked at other ciphers the killer had sent. One by one, he cracked the ciphers and completely solved another. Within two minutes, he had absolutely confirmed the secret identity of the Zodiac killer multiple times. Law enforcement and cryptographers have been searching for this identity for over 50 years. Finally, the search is over. He has been found. And if anybody would like to pay twenty-seven ninety-nine, they can read Finding the Zodiac Killer by David Daniel, How I Deciphered the Identity of the Nation's Most Notorious Serial Killer. Me, personally, I'm going to pass, but um, if you do not want the $28 and it's burning a hole in your pocket, I guess you could do that. Now, I've talked to you guys about some other types of material in the past. I said that I had wanted to read Ken Maines's book, Unsolved No More, for a very long time, and I said that the other book, about homicide investigations and detective work that I had wanted to read was Homicide, A View from Inside the Yellow Tape by Cloyd Steiger. And I've been reading that one recently, and it shares a lot of insights as to not only how were these investigations conducted, but how do the detectives think, and how do people who are associated with these real true crime stories evaluate the information, what's going on in their mind. I mean, that's what the book is about. Cloyd Steiger is sharing his personal experiences as a homicide detective and putting it all into play for the reader. So I started out by reading that book, and very early on in the book, Cloyd Steiger talks about how what you see on television, like these cases like the Zodiac Killer or other serial killer investigations, are actually very infrequent and a very small part of what a homicide detective does. Number one, homicide detectives mostly dealing with the actions of gang bangers and thugs who commit shootings because they want to appear to be tough, or that's done in a dispute over gang territory or robberies and so on. And number two, there can be a certain secretive side and aspect of the detective's work. And this was definitely explored in one of the early chapters when he tells the story of how a man committed arson. He set a building on fire, and four firefighters lost their lives in the flames. And that man was charged with murder because even though he started the fire in the building and the firefighters weren't even there, he committed an illegal action, and this led to the deaths of four people. Therefore, he is responsible for murder. But this is a story that took a big turn because the guy fled the country and he went to Brazil. And Brazil had no extradition treaty with the United States of America. So as a homicide detective, Cloyd Steiger is attending these meetings. And he is in one of the meetings, they proposed a way to catch him, to get around the extradition treaty. And they wanted to send people to Brazil to kidnap this person and drag him across the border into Uruguay, which had an extradition treaty 
with the United States, and they simply said that he wasn't a Brazilian, he had no connection to Brazil, he wasn't Brazil's problem, they could have done that. But they ended up using a different set of legal means to extradite him back to the United States, and they can also go through international warrants for people who are fleeing the country specifically to avoid prosecution. A bunch of technical things were explored in the book. But just that type of thought process that goes on is something that I didn't really think about too much with. I mean, the CIA, the FBI, okay, sure, I would expect them. But even hearing those things going down to the homicide detectives in Washington State, and they're all in the loop on these types of actions, was a little bit surprising to me. Some of you guys might be like, no, happens all the time. Well, I was a little bit surprised by it. But one of the ways they were able to get this arsonist back to the United States of America is that Brazil does not have a felony murder charge. Everything is on par with the equivalent of manslaughter in the country. So they had to drop the charges from murder to manslaughter, and then that was one of the ways they were able to extradite him back. Very, very different than other parts of the world. And also, there are different state laws in the United States of America. For example, when I talked about the story of Jennifer Me on this channel, I have an episode about her, and she is referred to as the Hiccup Girl, the Hiccup Girl Killer, and most famously, the case is called the Hiccup Murder. It's the murder of Shannon Griffin, which Jennifer Me orchestrated, and she was a participant in orchestrating it, to be precise, but she most likely did not pull the trigger. Yet because she was in Florida, it was the same story. She had participated in illegal actions that led to the death of this person. She was not only convicted of murder, but she got an automatic life sentence without the possibility of parole. Whereas the guy that committed the arson that killed the four people, he would have been eligible for, for, for parole because they had not only that, they had to drop the charge to manslaughter first and foremost, and he was able to get out of prison, but with somebody like Jennifer Me, who made more or less made an arrangement for Shannon Griffin to buy marijuana from someone, oh yeah, well you can meet this guy, and that person killed him because she was involved with the illegal setup, and it's not only that, she planned a robbery, and it got out of control, so she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The state laws in America are also very inconsistent, and I mean, this is just some stuff that I think is very good to keep in mind when examining true crime cases. And there's also a fascinating story in the book Homicide, The View from Inside the Yellow Tape, and it relates to the murder of Constance Murray, where sometimes you have a very complicated mystery like the Zodiac Killer, and other times the evidence just all falls into play. Think about what Cloyd Steiger said at the beginning about how he deals with lots of things from thugs and gangbangers. This woman named Constance Murray was murdered in her home. She was stabbed viciously, and they began to investigate. They found drug paraphernalia. They thought that the suspect was a drug addict. They looked at the people, such as the boyfriend, and he checked out. It wasn't him. They asked around. People didn't really know what happened, so they decided to interview the son of Constance Murray, and he said, it was my brother. My brother did it. My brother killed her. They're like, well, how do you know? He has a serious drug problem. He's been out of control lately. I told my mom, don't let him in. She must have anyway, and they were able to track down that guy's brother, the son of Constance Murray, to a motel, and ultimately, they took him in, and they found his fingerprints on the murder weapon, which was left at the scene, and he confessed to everything and entered a guilty plea. It all just fell into place. They had the evidence. They had the confession. It was all there, and it just fell into place. Think about that in contrast to the Zodiac Killer. Fifty-four years. We have no idea who the Zodiac is. I know some people out there, like the guy selling the book for 28 bucks, he thinks he knows who the Zodiac is. But to everyone's satisfaction, the case has not been solved. And ultimately, that should tell you some things. That a lot of these homicide investigations are very simple and straightforward. And some of these serial killer stories that we talk about here on Black Box Online Radio, very complex. But they are not the run of the mill. They are not the ordinary stories. They are the ones that are the exceptions that can prove the rule. And one more time, that's from the book. Homicide, The View from Inside the Yellow Tape by Cloyd Steiker. And some of you may be already thinking that 
October 30th is the anniversary of the murder of Sherry Jo Bates, and I haven't been talking about her in this episode because in 2021, I heard something from the radio host Brian Davis, who hosts the Tate LaBianca radio program, along with Tana Laufenberg. She's in a lot of the episodes. And he said that he was asked to do a memorial tribute for the victims of the Tate LaBianca murders, Sharon Tate and Jay Sebring, Abigail Folzer, Wojtek Frakowski, Stephen Parent, and Lino and Rosemary LaBianca. And he said that he was not going to do a memorial tribute on the dates of the La Tate LaBianca murders, August 8th and 9th, because he talks about them very frequently, and he wanted to use that as a chance to let the victims truly rest in peace. So that's all I will say about Cherry Jo Bates. Rest in peace to her. Thank you so much for listening to this episode, and if you have any comments about the books I've been discussing, or the suspects I've been discussing, or the interview series, thank you, um, and please put your ideas in the comment section down below. I would love to read them. Maybe your comment will be worked into a future episode of Black Box Online Radio. And anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. Feel free to visit some of the other links. Buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnid88. Also, I'm the author of the book Killer on a White Horse. And the audiobook version of that is coming out every weekend. I release some of the chapters from time to time on the weekends. And audiobook, you can listen for free. And I will see you over on Instagram, Blackboxnet over there. And goodbye.